So um, thanks for joining me tonight. And we are going to talk about one of my favourite subjects, one of my favourite topics, uh, and it's ethics and coaching. Uh, and we're going to look at some examples, not just from my days in terms of coaching and playing, uh, but also from yours, because I understand we've got a, a wide variety of experiences uh, in our room. And I'm going to encourage you to share those as much as you possibly can and share your, your personal values and beliefs around ethics and coaching and where where things stand in terms of uh, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable uh, for you personally. And we will encourage you to share those uh, in the breakout rooms, just as we normally do. We'll have some, some hopefully good, open and honest conversations. So those are just some images that hopefully might prompt some memories, maybe some feelings that you might uh, be able to recall and draw upon, especially if you support any of those teams. Um, and we will go into a little bit more depth and some additional examples I'm sure you've got on file uh, around ethics and coaching from your days of playing and coaching. So uh, I want to start with this, this topic. So if you, if you were to imagine that we were looking for the next leader of the country, um, if you were to imagine we were looking for the next prime minister, the next manager of your team, what words would you want to to put in a chat box that would describe the sort of person that you would want in terms of their morals, their values, things that they hold dear to them. So Confident. think about that and put those words in the chat box. Anything you can think of, just put in the chat box. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure, because it did give a big portion to dance. Okay. Ready, right, so we've got a few coming in. Some interesting ones here. Some fairly, fairly basic, um, generic ones. We've got a few more people that could add some bits to it. What else could we put in there? We've got quite a few more people. We've only got four so far. All right, good. So we've got a few words coming in that, to describe the sort of person that we would want in charge. And we'll go into those words in a little bit uh, more detail as we go. So in terms of ethics, the definition of ethics would be somebody that has moral principles uh, that govern a person's behavior or, or the way that they conduct an activity. That's what we're looking for. And I'm sure that you would potentially consider yourself as somebody that's got, you know, good ethical values. But when it comes to sport, sometimes they, those things change. Uh, and not all the time, but sometimes they do. Sometimes it happens uh, when you're in the role of a player. Sometimes it happens when you're in the role of a coach. And it might, you know, your values might change depending on the context that you're in. So even in terms of a coach, you might feel that some things are acceptable uh, at sort of grassroots, uh, not acceptable at grassroots, but they might be acceptable as you start working with elite players, for example, where there's three points on the line or there's money on the line. Different things that might change how your, your compass uh, operates. So we'll look at some of those words in a little while when we go into a bit more detail. But you've given me some information that would suggest that you would be looking for somebody who's uh, in line with that definition. So somebody who's got good moral principles. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. So when I looked at the understanding self model uh, that I spoke to you guys uh, on our initial webinar, one of the, the slides I used, and I got quite a lot of feedback and requests for it, was around how I came up with my coaching philosophy. It took a long time in terms of uh, coming up with a structure to understand how I would be able to write a comprehensive um, coaching philosophy rather than just a, a list of buzzwords, if you like. So when it comes down to uh, how I would want to manage uh, players, I'd be really clear on how I would want to manage players. And I, I know that, and I'm not going to go into mine because it's not about me. This is about sort of challenging you and your understanding of yourself. This is an extension of that work that we did around self. Um, but at the center of my coaching philosophy is my values and my beliefs. Uh, and questioning myself, do they remain consistent no matter what context I work in? Or are they written in pencil, not ink, if you like? So that, that's one way I would look at it uh, in terms of looking at tonight. My, my discussion points are going to be around your coaching philosophy and are your behaviours consistent? 
Uh, and are they consistent for you? And are they consistent for the players that you would work with? Are they consistent in different areas? And if not, why not? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just going to challenge you as to, to why that might be different. So based on that, uh, that slide there is one of my favorite slides. I'm going to ask you uh, a quick question around your, your relationship with ethics. Now, when we look at ethics, often some people classify it as, oh, it's either black or white, or, you know, there's a gray zone in the middle. Uh, the interesting bit for lots of people, and it came about through a, a tweet I put out the other day, is, well, how big is the gray zone? How big is that area where it depends is acceptable? Now, for lots of people out there, we, we might go, actually, the, you know, the, the right and the wrong is very small, and we would classify in a, in a spectrum. And we would look at, at one end, this is okay, this is acceptable in the game, whereas something at the other end is unacceptable. And for some people, it might be an example of diving. Diving is unacceptable. Initiating contact or engineering contact is unacceptable. Some people might classify handball as unacceptable, whereas others might say, no, it's, you know, it's part of the game. It's almost a tactical foul. Um, it's like pulling somebody's shirt back to delay the attack, and it's acceptable. So my question to you as a group would be, what is acceptable in terms of you and your relationship with that gray area? Is it just black and white? Or is it black, white, and gray, and there's a little bit in the middle? Or is it black, white, and gray, and there's a huge chunk in the middle? Because as a player, I've, been, I've experienced all three of those. And as a coach, I've experienced all three of those. So the first thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you into a breakout room to discuss your relationship with ethics. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you to talk about, well, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable in the game? But the most important bit within that discussion is you've got to talk about why. You have to go through, why is it acceptable uh, in different environments, okay? So I'm going to put you into those rooms. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to chat about it. So you've got plenty of time. We're going to have four people in a room, plenty of time to talk, share your ideas, challenge each other. And I'm going to bounce in between the rooms. We've only got three rooms, so I'm going to bounce in and around. And then we'll come back and have a chat. So you should be going into one of those rooms any second. Guido, are you there? There was some absolutely brilliant conversations, some nice debate, uh, very civilized as well, to be fair. Uh, we didn't have anyone who was sort of over the top at win at all costs <laughs> and, and almost uh, condoning Roy Keane-esque violence in terms of winning football matches, which is, which is good to hear uh, at any stage, elite or sort of grassroots. There were some really interesting points um, and I'm going to jump, can I, Drew, can I go to your room? Can, can you just sum up some of the things that you guys spoke about very quickly? There was a, there was a conversation about um, whether this is different depending on the age or the level that you're coaching at. Um, we talked a little bit around sort of game management, whether there's, whether there's a difference between sort of the ball going out and you walk in pick the ball up or staying on the ground a little bit longer after you've been fouled, maybe depending on the situation in the game. Um, we talked a little bit about um, whether players are sort of tricking the ref or tricking the other players and whether when players make certain decisions like um, a last man tackle, that they know they're going to probably know they're going to get a red card for sort of taking one for the team, whether that's whether that's the same or whether that's just whether that's cheating or whether that's making a decision where they know they're going to be punished. Um, and then we discussed a bit about how other cultures see these things um, and kind of winning at all costs the, the kind of the uh, the view of winning at all costs in other cultures some interesting debates in there um, and there was some one there was some stuff they spoke about in that room when I just joined and it was talking about I think Kev Finney was talking about um, sort of social learning and learning from peers um, and it might not be that stuff is necessarily taught by the coach but the players know it and they've learned it whether it's from each other 
or by watching it in games, um, professional games, etc. The interesting bit there, the sort of question that I would have is, well, if it's not taught, but the players know it, does the coach then discourage it as part of their values, their framework, or is it okay? Because I didn't teach it, but it's going to help us win games. So sometimes we can almost pass the pass the buck in terms of responsibility. So that's an interesting question when it comes to working with players, especially in developmental phases. Um, but there were some really some good insights in there, especially when you've got uh, different environments, different contexts. If you've got, a, you know, 16 year olds at grassroots, um, you know, some of the things they might talk or might learn in academy football might be very different because they're potentially playing for a professional contract. Uh, and they, you know, if they have a game and they don't have a great game and they, they make a fundamental mistake or they don't know how to deal with some of the dark arts that go on in the game, they might not get a second game. They might not get that contract. They might not get the move to the bigger club, et cetera. So sort of when do they need to know this and how do we help them learn it is an interesting conversation. There was some really good stuff though. Uh, let's go to David. Can we go to your room, please? Ponica, Poncia, I don't know how you pronounce that. Yes, yes Poncia, that's it. It's good, good effort, Kevin, that's it, right? I've heard it all. Um, yeah, so we spoke quite a lot of uh, different subjects. We spoke about, um, again, same as what Drew was saying with the, you know, depending on the level of the game, you know, would your ethics be different at an under eights game as it would be in a match that's, you know, three points are on the line on a Saturday. Um, Nicola was saying that he, he's part of a team where results are uh, a results business for him, you know, matches. So, you know, but he he, he really pushed his, he, he encourages his players to to keep with his ethics and, and and how he promotes the game to be played in a, in a fair way. So that was quite interesting. Um, we also spoke about uh, a lot of the things that go on, you know, whether it be ethics, it, the, the, the default excuse for a lot of coaches seems to be, well, I'm just passionate. So we spoke about, so what does that really mean? You know, because it's almost like a free get out for everybody if you're behaving like an idiot. Well, I'm just passionate, I'm just passionate. So, you know, we spoke about where does passion cross the line? Um, you know, it's, I guess it, that, that line's different for everybody, but there has to be, I think, a shared line where, where we all agree that, you know, enough's enough. Um, I can't pronounce his name. Um, is it Gordio? Gordio? Guido, Guido, that's Guido, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, he, he was just telling us about, you know, an issue that he had, he's he got in his league where they, they came up against a team that was particularly physical side. Um, the club seems to have a reputation of, of this in, in and around the local FA. Uh, we, we, it sort of sounded like a team issue at the start, but the more we got into that conversation, it sort of started to drift towards maybe this is the club philosophy to, to, to play like this way, you know, to, to be physical, to be dominant on the pitch. And, you know, if that's the way they're being asked to play, can um, you, I mean, is it the coach's fault if they're being told, this is what we expect from you when you take over a team? This is what you we, we demand of you from our players. You know, that's again up for debate, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was James mentioned uh, the Mourinho or the Spurs documentary and mentioned about Mourinho and sort of some of those things being dripped in to the players that you've got to be a bit meaner if you want to win things. I won't use the language that Mourinho used, but uh, I'm sure we've all seen the quotes and it was just around, you know, what you are as a person off the pitch and what you are as a player when you cross that white line. They need to be different. And that he was looking for different things. Sometimes coaches might instill that in a club or the club might have those values. Uh, and the players can't necessarily differentiate um, because of where they're at in terms of the, the environment they're at. There's some really valid points in there. Uh, I've got one more room. What was the, the last room? Who do we have in there? Who was in your room, uh, David? Was it you, Guido, and who else? Uh, Nicola was in there with us. Uh, Stephen was in with us. Uh, yeah, that was that. Let's go. Oh, to, uh, Smith as well, I think, was, was there for a bit. Brilliant. We'll go... Uh, James's room then, last one. Go on in, I'll, I'll go first. So as, as was already mentioned, we, we spoke about Mourinho and him sort of coming out and mentioning how his players need to be uh, not so nice to, to start winning, um, which in my opinion sort of imply, it implies that, you know, you can have to do some of these little things to gain an advantage from time to time. We'll turn a blind eye to certain to certain things. Um, we also spoke a little bit about cult culture and what's acceptable in this country might not be 
the same as as other countries and vice versa. Um, we spoke about the hand of God versus Jeff Hurst's goal in the World Cup and, and you know, our, our memories of both and how we sort of tend to go into a bit more detail with the hand of God rather than the goal uh, against Germany. Granted, it was slightly different and the, the officials actually gave the goal um, against Germany. It was a different era where we didn't have goal, goal line technology, etc. cetera. Um, the, the Robbie Fowler penalty incident, which I've watched back since we come, come out of the room, um, when he goes down, gets up straight away and says, no, 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 you didn't touch me. It's not a penalty. He still took the penalty, um, Seaman saved, but then the rebound was followed up and they scored. Um, and also about, uh, I think I've, I've attended this course before, uh, this sort of workshop in person. And there was an interesting point I took away where, you know, be careful what you coach kids, even things like sort of, you're teaching someone to you know when they're dribbling in the penalty area if they cut across someone and they're taken down you know if you do that you've got a chance of winning a penalty you know that can be worded slightly differently when you're working particularly with younger players so just maybe consider your your wording when you're working with younger players that was uh that was what i remember from the uh from our room i don't know if anyone else in that room had, had anything to add perfect Okay, so just on that, there were some, some interesting points uh, mentioned about cutting across people. So I was always taught when you get into that box, hit the brakes. If you're, if you're more than 1v1 and you've got past that white line, slam on the brakes, stop, stick your backside out, initiate contact. As soon as they hit you on the backside, go down, take a, take a penalty. And we were taught that from a young age in academy football. We were taught lots and lots of stuff. Uh, recently, I've been talking to people about how to... How to um, hold people effectively so lots of the time now you'll see uh you know coaches um, would have they worked on it in training but people grabbing hold of each other's shirts etc uh, so you would have seen that over years and years and years um, and it was something that was brought in and players got used to it and if they kind of just accepted it was part of the game now they don't necessarily hold each other's shirts what they're doing is they're holding each other's wrists uh, so when they they lock on to somebody's wrist if you hold somebody's wrist that person now can't get hold of your shirt players are being taught this at academy level uh, hold somebody's wrist like that rather than their shirt if you hold their shirt they can break the lock all they have to do is if you hold somebody's shirt get their arm straight strike the elbow and the the, the break will uh, the lock will break so that's the idea behind um, sort of some of the things that are being done in academies and when i spoke to somebody who works in in that professional environment who's working with players around about 18 19 years old and he said look we're not necessarily teaching them how to cheat but if we are going to teach people how to cheat we're going to teach them how to do it properly that was an interesting comment we're not going to teach them how to get caught so teaching people to pull on the shirt you're going to be you're going to get caught but you're going to get picked up on that so if you are going to teach people how to cheat teach them how to cheat properly blew my mind but what you got to remember is these guys are they're trying to play for professional contracts and they are the coaches in there I'm not just helping those players play for professional contracts. Often what happens with those coaches is the coaches are, are playing. Um, not sure where that from. But the, the, sorry, I'll just mute that person. Um, so the coaches are, are not only helping the players get professional contracts, the coaches are trying to move further up the ladder themselves as well. So if, if, the players uh, that they produce are seen as being uh, first team worthy, first team ready. It looks good for the coach. The coach then moves up the, the, the pecking order as well. So it is an interesting uh, dynamic of how coaches are using players to further their own career as well. So just bear that bit in mind. There's loads of useful information uh, that you guys have already discussed. Uh, interestingly, I don't know how many of you would be brave enough to stick a flag in the middle of a pitch in Turkey but good luck, you'd have to be as tough as soon as to do that. I wouldn't be doing that either. Um, but when you look at some of the examples that are on the, the slides there, some of it will be around mind games and, and verbal stuff, some physical that goes on. Um, some of it uh, is a little bit mixture of, of both, if you like, and we can have a look at those. So little mind game, Beckham barely, barely touched Simeone, and all of a sudden he goes down. Whereas I think if that happened to uh, one of one of his players moving forward, I don't think he would be too happy nowadays. Um, so the values might change. And I mentioned it earlier, when you're a player versus when you're a coach or as to what you would think would be acceptable. So 
with that in mind, you've discussed some of these. Uh, no one really said that, you know, stealing yards was unacceptable from a throw-in or free kick. No one said that was too bad. Happens all the time. Sometimes it can change the game. But is it okay? Is it not okay? I'm not sure. That's, that's something you might encourage, but you might not necessarily discourage. You know, blocking or holding at set pieces. Often people are saying, you know, that's part of the game now. We need to, we need to embrace that. And we've kind of learned that bit from basketball. And then we go, well, we've learned that bit from basketball. So culturally, that's now okay in our game. We're blocking people at set pieces. But, you know, engineering contact is not okay. Whereas in basketball, you're taught to engineer contact. If somebody stands still and you are you charge into them, then uh, potentially you're going to draw a foul. If they're moving, you're going to draw a, a foul against them. That's one of the key bits that we forget. Sometimes we go, this is what we value as morally acceptable in our society. We don't look and, and turn around and go, well, what can we learn from other sports? In that sport in America, that's one of the, the ways that you can get an additional point. All of a sudden, you're jumping up. Uh, that person's moving. They haven't set their feet. You've initiated the contact by jumping into them. You now throw the ball up. You score a basket. You get an extra point. That's not unacceptable in, in their laws of the game. It's part of the game. It's one of the things that they're taught. So it's just something to, to consider. Uh, and in our game now, what we have is players are sticking their leg out. Uh, they're, in, they're engineering contact. They're initiating contact. And it's a little bit different because I, I personally feel that it's more bordering towards uh, diving than it is sort of engineering contact and drawing a foul. But lots of them are, are now taking it to the extreme where they're putting out the, the leg uh, we're jumping into somebody and Ashley Young used to get a lot of criticism for it and Vardy does as well, where they would run, stick a leg into somebody, dive over and then all of a sudden it would be classified as a foul and a penalty. Uh, one of the ones that came up uh, in Drew's room was around tactical fouls, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, you know, especially when you're aware of the punishment. Nobody really spoke too much about getting at the ref because um, that's an interesting one. As a, a ploy, sometimes coaches can, can encourage their players to do that uh, or rotational fouling. Players might take that upon themselves or it might be a team instruction i've seen it before uh, and I, know, I know people that have done it before where there are so uh, there are clear ploys around getting in and around one particular player and kicking lumps out of them but taking it in turns to do it uh, so you know you might not you might get not not get booked on the first one so then somebody else goes in they might not get booked as well and all of a sudden that player the opposition player has had two or three quite rough challenges before somebody actually picks up a booking. Uh, and those are quite quite common, uh, especially at um, sort of non-league level. Those are, are ploys that I've certainly been aware of previously. An interesting one um, that didn't really come up was around sort of name calling, verbals. Often that's considered okay. Um, and then it starts to come down to, well, when does it become unacceptable? That's an interesting one. So for example, uh, here's, here's an interesting one. Getting, getting at somebody about having red hair or ginger hair can, can be an easy way to have a dig at somebody. Now, if somebody uh, had dreadlocks and you started having a, a, a go at them around that, have you now crossed a different line? Are you now, in the referee's eyes, potentially using uh, racially abusive language? That's an interesting question. You're, you're talking about two people, both have hair that might be considered different, where do we draw the line and say that one is racial and one is not? That's an interesting one because I've seen it at non-league level where people are constantly on about the way people look. You fat this or whatever it might be or ginger this. So <clears throat> when we talk about what uh, is encouraged within players or discouraged with players, be aware of some of those things that happen, um, especially if those players are representing you or your team as a coach uh, and the values that you want your club to represent when they're on the pitch. So if the players' values don't represent and align with what the club's doing, definitely I would be pulling people aside to make sure that we're having strong conversations about that. And I'm not just saying that because I used to have ginger hair. I, I would never be lucky enough to be able to grow dreadlocks. But believe it or not, I used to have a big ginger mop on top of my head. So I used to get ginger this all the time. And it used to drive me up the wall. It used to motivate me more than anything. So it's just something to consider moving forward around uh, name calling. And there's lots of examples that you can come across. Um, for me, when I, when I was thinking about it, uh, and I looked at that spectrum earlier, I think that the black and white zone is a lot closer than you think. So 
for me, I, I would question it and say, well, is it really a spectrum at all? Because when we look at a spectrum, it means that it's almost at opposite ends. We've got one end that's right, one end that's wrong, and then in the middle there's this big grey bit. Whereas when I was thinking about it, and I'm starting to draw some stuff out, I, I don't think the gap is that big. So then it became a matter of actually, how can I draw this visually? And uh, anyone who's been on the course uh, workshop before, that's a new slide um, because you wouldn't have seen that one because it was an idea that only came to me a couple of days ago. It's something that I personally think is worth exploring. I don't think that they are miles apart when it comes to what's right and what's wrong uh, and the size of the gray zone, but it is something that's worth uh, further investigation and further research from myself and going off and having a little bit more digging around it because I think the, the image is quite a powerful one. So that's just something I wanted to highlight with you guys. So I've got a question for you based on all the information that we've just um, just been through. I've got a, a poll for you and it's a vote. It's a little bit different. So I want you to take yourself away from football in a minute. And this is an anonymous vote. So I want you to answer honestly. Uh, and it is, an, it is important. And it was taken by... Um, taken from watching one of those TV shows the other day. So here is the question, okay? Answer it honestly. If you can buy products in a charity shop and sell them for large personal profits, should you do it? But 70 30 per 70 30 split. Okay. Oh, it's, it's changed a little bit. So it's just gone. It's gone 54 to 46. There were some people taking their time. So some 54% of people have said no, you shouldn't do it. 46% have said yes. And the reason I asked that question is quite an important one. It's just to highlight that we all have different things that we consider to be um, acceptable. And it, I want to take it away from football. And there's nothing wrong with it. I honestly don't think there is. Because sometimes uh, charity shops might not be able to go down the route of being able to store all that stuff and might not have the capacity to go online and, and find customers that might be able to buy it, etc. Or you might turn around and say, yeah, actually, it is acceptable, but you should donate a portion of that money back to the charity. I don't know. And that came from the Martin Lewis money show I was watching the other day. But it was a really interesting question for me around sort of morals and, and what do we think is right and what do we think is wrong and how do we relate that to football? So the next question for you then, I've got one more question uh, on my poll. So question two. Uh, in fact, let me just get that one up. So here comes question two for you. You're guaranteed a long and successful professional career. The sacrifices you will get dementia as a result of heading the ball so frequently. Do you take the contracts? So we've got two that have said yes, uh, 10 that have said no. All right, so 17% for yes, 83% for no. Okay, oh, it's gone up. 3% have said yes. All right, uh, no, sorry, three people have said yes, 23%. Okay, so if you said yes, can you unmute yourself? One of you, just anyone if you're willing to volunteer, I'd be interested to know. Dave, go on then, David. Well, you know, dementia happens probably a bit later down the line. I could die way before then, and I would have lived the dream of a professional contract of a footballer. Interesting. Okay, <laughs> good. In, uh, and I, I'd just like to know why. I said earlier I'm going to ask why when, when it comes to certain things. Now, the reason that that's an important question or a pertinent question is uh, somebody asked me that question today, and I thought, actually, I'm going to put that in there because it was around the recent and relevant research that comes up. And I said, 100%, I'm taking that contract. I am. I would take that contract all day. I would. But then they were like, well, you know, when you get a little bit older, it didn't say what age you get dementia. So, you know, generally you do get a bit older, but it doesn't say what age. Uh, you know, what about your kids? Okay, what about my kids? But you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to remember all that stuff. So you get dementia, you won't be able to remember all those amazing memories that you've had. You probably won't remember all the money that you've made either. It was, so they, they were challenging me in, in my perception and 
by the time that I'd finished the conversation with them, I changed my mind. Because my initial answer was, yeah, I would, I would take that contract. And when the person kept asking me the questions, and this was just by WhatsApp, and they kept asking me the questions, I was like, no, that's it, I'm, I'm changing my mind. And it is quite an interesting one. Now, the reason that they were asking me was um, around heading practice. Said so as a coach, because they knew we were doing this workshop, right? As a coach, how many coaches out there insist on heading in training? Uh, or the players go for maximum effort when it comes to a 50-50 header in training? Now, this came about because we, we had a couple of uni games yesterday um, and there was two lads that went at it yesterday in the middle of the pitch. And any time the ball was in the air, they were going for headers. And in the end, we turned around and said, look, it's not worth risking yourself um, because there's a few things. One, if you get cut, we're going to have to have an ambulance service come out or you know, one of you could land funny. Um, we don't need all that with the coronavirus situation. We just don't need all that stuff. But there are lots of coaches out there that, be, that would be willing and driving and pushing that on. But in our eyes, it was just training. It was just a game. Um, take it easy. So bear that bit in mind with, with what the recent evidence and research says. Is that a risk worth taking? Because as a coach, you might go through and, and put loads and loads of effort and emphasis on, on heading and, and those heading practices. But you might not be around to deal with the repercussions of it later on. It might not be your problem. So it was just the way that this person framed it to me earlier, one of the lecturers. It's like, remember, as a coach, you might not have to deal with it. We're going to insist in lots of these people, head footballs, you know, especially at 50, 60 miles an hour. And the reality is, it's not our problem. We're not the ones heading the ball. We won't be the ones dealing with it later. We won't be the ones that are, um, are having to look after their parents. And it was a really interesting long WhatsApp conversation. But I just wanted to highlight with that with you around some ethical stuff around recent research that had come out. So on that, <clears throat> here's a question for you, another question. Um, and it's a, a hypothetical one. So if you knew a woman who was pregnant uh, and she had lots of children, three of them were deaf uh, or hearing impaired, two were blind, one had mental health issues, she had syphilis, would you recommend she have an abortion? Don't put anything in the chat box, just keep the answer to yourself. That's all I want, yes or no, that's all it is. Answer will, will become uh, sort of relevant later on and we'll, we'll run through these later on. But it was just a question. Now that came up um, on the A license task from many years ago uh, when I did my course. That was one of the questions on there. We had to do ethics, attitudes towards ethics. And one of the things that we had to do was come up with, uh, we had to sort of come up with arguments for and against all these different long questions. Uh, and one of the questions on there was, um, could you think of a law of the game change that would improve goals in football? or the number of goals. So people put down some things around, you know, taking free, free kicks to themselves or removing goalkeeper gloves, et cetera. So that might increase uh, the, the number of goals that are scored. There's no way the sponsors are gonna sort of um, advocate taking away goalkeeper gloves because obviously that's a large income stream for sponsors, uh, for brands, they're never gonna do that. So they tried to think of different ways uh, to do things that would be ethically acceptable uh, across all levels of football. It wouldn't cost much money. So if you took stuff away, uh, from goalkeepers, took the goalie gloves away. You could do that at every single level, from adult male to grassroots to uh, you know, female women's game at all levels. There was all these different um, sort of criteria that you had to look at. And that was one of the questions that was on there. So I'm going to go through a couple of the questions. Then there was a, a question around, you're now in charge of selecting the next leader. And you guys put some, some words in the box earlier in the chat box. So question two, we're, we're going to elect the leader to to vote on. Um, we're going to vote on a leader for the, uh, the the free world, if you like, not the American president, but we're going to vote on a leader that would be in charge of our world. OK, here's your candidates and you're going to put in the chat box which one you would vote for, one, two or three. Now, if you've uh, if you've seen this before, so and I know some of you have, uh, so I've seen some familiar faces that have been at this before. Um, don't spoil it. Don't put the names of the people. But so just vote for the person that you would vote for. OK. So this is candidate number one. Uh, you can have a quick read through their brief. So he's, uh, he's obviously been around some crooked politicians. Um, loves a, a little bit of astrology. It's not Boris Johnson for anyone that, that is looking at that thinking that it's, uh, it's him. So I'm just gonna put, put a disclaimer on there right now. So just have a think about number one, okay? This is number two. And these are, you know, these are not current politicians in case anyone's wondering. Uh, 
that's number two. Have a quick read through his brief. And this is candidate number three. So the question I would ask to you in the chat box, which person would you vote for? Just the number, one, two, or three. So three, one, <laughs> there's Rudy. We haven't had votes from everyone yet. Get your votes in, we'll tally them up. So we've got quite a few for two, a couple for two, a few for three. Okay, so I'll run through who they are. Uh, so these are the actual real life people. Number one is Franklin D. Roosevelt. That is who you would have voted for if you pick number one, if you remember his brief. Uh, so if you go back, he was, a crooked he was associated with crooked politicians, etc. I had a few drinks every day uh, and then sort of covered up a serious illness. Uh, candidate number two, uh, ejected from office twice, uh, fallen out with political colleagues, uh, sleeps until noon. Uh, sounds like, you know, somebody that I would sort of uh, recognise in modern day politics, if you like. Used to do drugs in college, etc. Candidate number two was Winston Churchill. Candidate number three, Adolf Hitler. So it's interesting when we look at what, when you put those words in the box right at the beginning of our, our chat around what we potentially look for in a leader, some of those words might be similar to what we've got there. Not necessarily, you know, a vegetarian, nobody put that in there. Um, but somebody has a look in there around the people that are, are quite steady in terms of uh, how the public might perceive them. And that's what happened when you look at what you guys voted for there. So you guys voted for him based on what you were sold in that message there around three. Now, the interesting bit is, well, how do we then sell ethics? That's the bit that I would ask you. How do we sell ethical coaching to, to, coaching to coaches? How do we sell doing the right thing, not doing the thing that's going to win you the games? That's the hardest bit for me when I talk about coach development. How do we go around getting a message across to coaches that this is the right thing for kids? Don't worry about um, running down the clock. Don't worry about taking the ball to the corner. You know, when there's five minutes to go and you, you know, you're four nil up and you see teams taking the ball to the corner. Why do we, how do we get that message across? That's the interesting bit for me moving forward, because I think we all have a vital role to play in that. Whether you're a mentor, whether you're a, a tutor, a coach educator, whether it's a coach at your club and you're, you're supporting them from a peer perspective. How do we sell what is best for everyone? That is one of the most difficult challenges that we have um, because what often we, we come across in our game is coach is the one that would perceive uh, their importance in, the, in that role of society of being the one that is down to me in terms of making sure the results happen. But we, we know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we know, more often it's down to the kids. Once they cross that white line, they can't really, they can't really do much um, when it comes to what we say anyway. Game's happening so fast. So can we then turn around and sell them the benefits instead of running that ball into the corner, get someone to take a risk? Can we try and get them to, you know, stop pinching all these yards up the line or just throwing it down the line? Because that's not necessarily the best way to move forward, especially when you look at rule changes, which is why I mentioned it earlier, that Arsene Wenger wants to bring in for the laws of the game. Some of you would have seen that in his new role uh, around throw-ins in the last five minutes, etc. So there are lots and lots of things that we could do to help kids because too often, uh, kids and coaches, too often what we do is we talk about the game of today and we don't talk about the game of tomorrow. With VAR, it's going to become ever more increasingly difficult to, to cheat or to operate in a deviant way, uh, especially at elite levels. It's going to become almost impossible. So what are we doing to help kids become better at that rather than focusing on the, the short-term wins, the little ways to win games, getting, getting in somebody's ear, um, or doing research before them. And I know non-league teams out there where the players go on social media, they look at their opposing players, they look on their Instagram pages, they look on their Twitter pages, uh, and they see what images they've got up, they see if they've tagged their girlfriends in it. And when it comes to a match day, they will talk to the opponent 
about their, their sister. They will talk to them about uh, the nightclub that their girlfriend has been in. Players are doing their own research and I'm telling you, it's been encouraged by some coaches to go off, do some in investigating around opponents that you're coming up against. It's never been easier to get information on the people you're playing against. To get those little psychological wins, start getting in their ear, put some doubt in their head. Uh, and it, again, even um, coming up against uh, family members and finding out information about them and saying stuff about them during the game, like especially some inappropriate stuff. And it happens all the time. And it's been encouraged in some clubs. So that was the answer to the first question as well. So if you'd said yes uh, to that question, we would not have had Beethoven's music. So every action has a consequence. So just bear that bit in mind. If you encourage uh, bad play uh, at youth level or even in senior level, there potentially will be a consequence for it. Now, sometimes people might say, you know, the consequence is worth living. You look at, you know, Maradona's handball, etc. He might turn around himself uh, if, he, if we'd have ever been lucky enough to ask him and say, listen, that was a price worth paying. You know, the whole world or, you know, 99% of the world didn't like me for what I did, but it didn't matter. I was Argentinian. 100% of Argentina loved me for what I did. I'm sure that would be the, the response. There wouldn't be too many people in Argentina that would be uh, angry around what he did. And now I can tell you why I believe that to be the case in 100% a, in a of, uh, in all reality, because how many of you were up in arms around um, Peter Crouch pulling on the Trinidad and Tobago players' dreadlocks when he won the header and scored a goal? Nobody. Rudy? Were you upset, Rudy? <laughs> so you're on mute. You're on mute, Rudy. And yeah, I just put my finger up to turn around and say I was one that was it. <laughs> what so was we out had, of order? So we, we had one. So one, maybe, maybe one more. But it is an interesting thing. We don't tend to find too many people that are outraged when it goes in favour of England. But it, that's one of the things that I think we have to bear in mind when we are starting to look at what we hold morally, morally fibrous, but we have to go back to how can we sell the benefits of playing the game ethically and coaching ethically so that everybody wins, not just the players, but the coach. The coach feels like they're getting something out of it as well, because it's fundamentally important that we do that. We, sh we shouldn't just go, listen, it happens, it's part of the game, let's just accept it. Why do we accept it? Why are we, why are we willing to say, you know, diving or initiating contact is, is acceptable? Why aren't we saying, look, that's not acceptable, get rid of it from the game. It's a bit like, uh, you know, smacking to, from teachers' perspective used to be acceptable in schools. You then turn around and say it's not acceptable, and it's not acceptable at home. And culturally, we are we have changed lots of things that we deemed acceptable. We now need to look at actually in sport and football what's acceptable. And the reason I say that is, most people, if a stranger started shouting at their child in the street uh, in an aggressive way, would be really furious about it. But acceptable behaviours like that occur every single Saturday and Sunday with coaches doing it to the children that are in their care. The parents don't seem to mind. But if somebody had done that to their child, you know, in Asda, they'd be uproar and they'd probably uh, some sort of big row going off. So for some reason, we find things acceptable in sport, but not, not outside of sport. The example one of you gave earlier around, you know, inappropriate touching in a recent um, championship game where the player held somebody's genitals twice. That is something that we have to go, actually, if that happened in the high street, There'd be serious charges uh, going off. So just think about how do we then sell the message? That's the bit that I would ask you. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to discuss that bit at the end, because that's the, that's the bit I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. Kevin, can I ask you a question? Of course you can, Guido. Um, what do you think about humiliating opposition, as in uh, you are already six six nil up but you keep scoring like it's gonna end up 20 nil or it is at all level obviously different yeah. each level so do, do you think that it, it, it's ethical i mean going like if you i i can't hear you sorry from my perspective i, I honestly don't think that it is I, i'm really not a fan of that uh, it drives me up the wall Honestly, I, I can't stand it um, because you end up, the way I see it is as a coach, you have a responsibility for your team, but you also have a duty of care to the other team, especially in youth football. That's my personal perspective. Um, some things have been brought in to, to try and help that. So 
for example, the power play rule that's adopted by quite a lot of leagues. So if you go 4-0 down and you play mini soccer, you can bring an additional player on. If you, are go, if you go 6-0 down, you can bring another player on. So the game ends up becoming 7v5. Um, and some leagues have adopted that, some haven't. Um, and some leagues have adopted it, but the coaches don't, don't necessarily follow it. So there are things that have been put in place at mini soccer. Um, but when it comes to, you know, like a county cup game, that can be really difficult. And teams just go out there and, and they get absolutely annihilated. They don't know who they're playing against. I'm not a fan of it. And it's something that I've, I've discouraged people from many, many times. Uh, and if you look at culturally in America, it's really unacceptable, uh, unacceptable in things like basketball. They really don't like it when that starts to happen. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know the answer of how you stop it because it's an education thing. Um, and it, it almost comes down to uh, how a coach wants to be perceived. Some of them will be happy being out there, being that one that, that wins 25 nil, whereas others, um, you know, I would feel embarrassed if that was to happen. And, and to be honest, my daughter's team at the minute, they, they play a little bit. Uh, my, my other half, Jess, she coaches them. Uh, and they, they're a strong side. They win quite a lot, or they've won every game this year. But when they start sort of going up quite heavily against teams, they swap players around. They encourage the other team to bring on uh, additional players so they make sure they know the rule. Um, and it, there has been times this year where they've added extra players on top. So it's been like an 8v5 to try and make it as fair as possible. So I would strongly suggest as much as you possibly can, uh, try and make the game as fair as possible. Nobody wins to, from that. Yeah. Just get as getting the goals. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to move on to this question. So this is a, one of my favourite questions. Um, so you're the coach of the team in the World Cup final. And I'm going to put you in the rooms to, to have a quick chat about this. You're the coach of the team in the World Cup final and you've got a magical pill, OK? That pill guarantees your team will win the World Cup. No current drug tests can uh, detect it. The only thing is you take that pill win the World Cup, but it will take 10 years off your life. Do you take the pill? You don't have to say yes or no. I'm going to ask you to have a quick chat in the room and I'm going to call you back in in about three or four minutes. It's not too long, but do you take the pill? That is in, uh, Dave, I know you're going to take it up there in the top here. <laughs> so we'll go from there. Okay, I'm going to put you into the room and we'll see what you Still come scores. up with. I'm going, to, I'm going to make different rooms so you can have a right. quick chat. Let's pause it. All right, never mind. Or was it saying to kick you out? Okay. My argument was, well, you, you said we'd lose 10 years of our life, but, you know, you might live to 100, not a world champion, but then I would have died at 90, a world champion. So, you know, in 10 years wouldn't have been a problem for me. But I don't know. We had an interesting discussion in the room. There was two, four, two against. So I don't know if Aaron was brave enough to speak up in front of everyone. I've dropped you in it. <laughs> I, I said uh, no, basically. Live, live to 100, live to 90, regardless of uh, whether you win a World Cup or not. Uh, could be 10 years extra with, I don't know, friends, family, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, that was my, um, that was my, my yeah. thoughts on it. It is interesting. So I had this conversation with some some people, very senior people in a football environment. Uh, and I asked them this question based on uh, sort of writing this workshop. Um, and every single one of them, and they'd all played professional, said, yeah, take the pill. 100%. What, what about their ages though, Kevin? Were they, were they young uh, players or were they uh, sort of so middle-aged? They're, they're retired, 45 plus. Oh, okay. Yeah, so all, all very senior in sort of uh, in, in football settings. If you want. I can't give away too much because you'll guess who they were. But oh, yeah, exactly. The <laughs> idea being, I just wanted to to challenge uh, to see what it would what it would mean to people that had, had played professional football in that environment and what it would mean to, for them to win the World Cup. Hundred percent, they they wanted to win the World Cup at any cost. That was it. Oh, it okay. doesn't matter what the cost was. Now, when I, we had the, the conversation, it led on to some different bits. So the next question that came about then was, okay, you don't have to take it, but would you give it to the players? So you get to keep your 10 years, but the players take it, they lose 10 years, you become world champion. Do you give it to the players? 
So you I, get I said the ten years. Sorry, I, on, said, I said the ten years were irrelevant. I mean, like you haven't you haven't won it, have you? I you agree with you. The ten years for me was just irrelevant. It didn't that didn't even come into my mind. It was just like why, kind of thing. I haven't won it in myself. I haven't won it. Interesting. Now, there, there's a real, there's a reason behind this question. Like, genuinely, there is an actual reason behind it. It's not just a hypothetical question. So, um, when I asked this question around the table, one of the guys says, "Look, I wouldn't take it, but at the same time, um, I wouldn't give my players the option to take it either." So we all started laughing. Oh, uh, he goes, "No, I wouldn't give them the option. I'd stick it in their bloody Lucasaid bottles." <laughs> Oh, so dear. that was the conversation that came. He was like, I want that's to win. Called, that's <laughs> called administering a poison. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. But it was really interesting the way that he said it. And he just said, look, he goes, ultimately, uh, I want to win the World Cup. That, that was my, my ambition as a player. That's what I want to do. And it did make me David, laugh. Start make also, it, sorry, David. Uh, do you think maybe the professionals have said all of that, that they would do it just because... Being in the professional game, maybe they understand the true sacrifices it have taken to get to that opportunity. Maybe it might just be the, the competitive nature where that meant everything to them. Like literally, their life was all about winning. Everything was about winning, and the end result was the most important thing. It didn't necessarily matter how you got there. You know, it's an environment where win at all costs was was the way that it worked for for these guys in the times that they played, and it was a, a rough time uh, like physically. Um, the interesting bit, sort of moving on from that, is the reason why I posed this question. So this question came about um, because of some research I'd done, um, and it, an academic uh, research on, uh, on a netball team, the Australian netball team, who were given the contraceptive pill without being aware that they were put on the contraceptive pill uh, in the 80s. So the women were entered into a world championships, they were given the contraceptive pill and told that it was there to improve their fitness. So they didn't know that that was what they were actually taking. Uh, and the reason they were given it is because the contraceptive pill uh, and the evidence goes back all the way to the 80s and they've only just started to adopt it now. The contraceptive pill reduces your risk of an ACL injury by about 20%. 20 so it's because of flexibility in the joints with the estrogen levels and all that sort of stuff. Then. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's all to do with uh, the cycle uh, and the hormone levels that come out around those times and then managing training loads appropriately. So the scientists found that if they put the, the female athletes on there, they could reduce the risk of an ACL injury, therefore keeping their entire squad fully fit for the championships. There was very unethical practices going on uh, in terms of giving the players that. The players weren't aware of it. And I made a joke about uh, just sticking it in their water bottles or their Lucozade bottles, but that actually happened, which is where that question came from. So in terms of an ethical practice, that has happened previously. Okay. Uh, dark arts. So one thing that I've spoken about a little bit, um, sort of linked to the ethics side of things that we, we've looked at is dark arts, tactics, strategies, how you might go about using these to win games, holding people, getting in somebody's ear, uh, and there's that spectrum again. Uh, and do, is it really a spectrum but my question to you is when it comes to dark arts do we teach the players or do we let them find out and at what level do we start teaching them some of the things now the reason I say that is uh, if you look at somebody uh, like uh, a, an under 16 let's say an under 16 under 17 goalkeeper all of a sudden first team get a big injury the, the first team need a goalkeeper to come in uh, but he's only going to be on the bench in the game your first team keeper, your sub first team keeper then gets injured. You've now got to bring your 16, 17, 18 year old keeper on who's not really dealt with men, big <laughs> physical men before. Academy football is very different. Um, so I've never been in that environment where they're going to have to deal with people getting in and around them, stamping on their toes at corners, you know, barging, um, you know, giving them verbals, all those little bits. But they've never really been in an environment where they've been challenged or taught how to deal with people at corners. Ethically, when you've got somebody who is standing on a goalie, uh, you know, that little striker whose job is to get in, and, get in and around and disrupt them. Ethically, we seem to think that's OK. Get in there, disrupt the goalkeeper. Coaches do it all the time. We've, I mean, we've all probably been in games where somebody's role is to go stand on the goalie. Get in their way, stop them coming from the cross. Uh, get on their toes, etc. Block them, do whatever you can. So that bit's OK. We seem to think that's OK. 
Now, at the other end of it, we go, well, is this practice, I'm going to ask you this, is this practice therefore unethical? The goalkeeper, to get him away, grabs hold of the, the forward, the young, let's say young Jermaine Defoe, who's in and around the goalkeeper, gets hold of him really tightly so he can't get away and screams in his ear as loud as he can, Mark a man! Is that unethical? If he grabs hold and screams in his ear so that on the next corner, Jermaine Defoe doesn't come and stand on his toes. Anybody. Is it unethical? Or is it just part of the game? Part of the game. Anyone agree, disagree? I wouldn't advocate the grabbing hold of. The screaming, there is no, I don't see there's anything wrong with the goalkeeper giving instructions to the team to do a certain thing. But the grabbing hold of the player into the ear roll, oh, I wouldn't be happy with that. So he's grabbing hold of him so that he can make sure he doesn't get away. Uh, so he's giving the instructions. The players are marking up anyway. But as a referee, I don't think you can book somebody for telling everyone to mark up. No, no. That's, so that's, you'd argue that's within the laws of the game. So that's where we go. So is that in the grey zone or how big is that grey zone again? Is it getting bigger or are we saying that it's black but and white? In someone's, the in someone's ear business is for the purpose of doing what? What are, we, what are we seeking to achieve in doing that? Stop, Stop that player him. standing next in front of me. Right. He so in grabbing, hold of, in grabbing hold of someone, is the goalkeeper allowed to grab hold of someone? Within the laws of the game? No. No. They're, they're, they're not allowed to stand on his toes, though. But you know that happens when on corners. They get in there. You know, it yeah. might not be deliberate, if, if deliberate, but it does happen. Well, it is deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, exactly, you know what I mean. You know, accidents happen, don't they? We've all been there. But will we also say that most of us might encourage our goalkeeper to own his six-yard box? So would that will be part of it? So when yeah, we say own... Be confident and, and present yourself well mm. to show that you've got some character in there. But are we saying within the laws of the game or are we saying do what you want as long as it's in your six-yard box? See, the, the message is... One thing, the interpretation of it can be different, can't it? It's about the words that we're using to make it clear about what we're, we're wanting people to do and where the limits are in that. If we say to someone, if you were to shout in his ear, it wouldn't be good, but he might not come again, then what you're actually inferring is, can you please do it, aren't we? Mm -hmm. See what I'm getting at? That, I would... that might well have been said. I'm, like I'm not saying that it, it was said in that in those exact words, but I, I have been in dressing rooms where where those words have been very similar to uh, to what you've just suggested. Yeah. But it is interesting when we turn around and we look at well, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and why is it acceptable? So lots of people here will say, look, you know what, that's not acceptable. Some of us will say, look, it's part of the game, it's laws of the game. We're not really infringing too much. And other people go, look, I, I just don't agree with it, despite mm -hmm. the fact you know that 16 year old if for example, uh, let's say that, that number nine comes in on the next corner uh, and heads one in. Well, he's, he's headed one in because you haven't managed to deter him and put him off. There goes your contract. You might not get your second contract, your second game. Go for it, John. I'll see your hand up. Is there a difference between what's ethical and what's moral and cheating? Because I would say I would look at a game of football and say, if you have players who are, for example, the goalkeeper and he's got players around him, he's not protecting himself. He might have a poor performance. He might concede a goal. That might have effects on him in the long term. I'm not asking you to cheat, but I'm asking you to compete almost. I don't know. It's an interesting one, though, because we all know that there's little pushes that go on. So is that a cheat? Uh, and we are talking about... Someone is challenging you, and you're just gonna sort of let it go. Sorry, mate, I can't hear you. Microphone's gone. Your microphone killed me, definitely. Yeah, that went, went a bit crazy there, mate. Drop the pen over. Oh, somebody kept it turned up. Sorry, John, I can't hear you. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But it is interesting to so start thinking about the dark arts. When do we learn them? 
how do the players learn them and use them and do we ever discourage them because there are lots of things even down to little things where we go stand on a free kick that's a dark art we've all been taught that for many many years stand on a free kick stand over it why well we do it to slow the game down so often we say oh, we hate it when the other team take it to the corner when they've got it but when we lose it we stand on a free kick so there are lots of things that seem to be acceptable for us, but not acceptable when the other team does it. And that was a conversation that happened in one of those rooms about Mourinho uh, and, you know, what's acceptable with his team versus what's acceptable with other teams. And they would come out and talk about those. But the dark arts are something that I feel uh, if we want to win a tournament, potentially England might need to get better at. But then it comes down to, do we, do we want to change the identity? Do you want to change the DNA? Now, I mentioned before about a, an international team, a South American team. One of the England youth teams went and played a tournament uh, against a South American team, uh, under 16, under 17 level. The opposition came up before the game and gave everybody friendship bracelets. Uh, and on those friends, some of the players wore the friendship bracelets, the England players, some didn't, they didn't bother. Um, but on the, the friendship bracelets, um, the opposition had managed to put some sort of liquid on there that in terms of institutionally had been uh, to, had been put on there deliberately to try and affect the England players' eyes. So when the, the players were wiping their heads with their sweat, <laughs> stuff started to drip down into their eyes and the players complained to the referee during the game that they were going blind. They couldn't see. These players were encouraged organisationally to give those to the opposition. Culturally, that was acceptable. That happened. Wow. That conversation happened at the same table I mentioned around the, the magic pill question. So it is really important you are aware. Kev, I would Sorry, say that's, that, that goes beyond the, the, the definition, what, what might be termed the definition of dark art, surely. It's called well, administering a poison. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, that's, there's a lot. And we're talking about the lines, isn't it? We're talking yeah, about the lines. And, 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 and I mean, even the language of the dark arts, it sounds quite ominous. Whereas yeah. if we said, the, the craftsmanship or, or the gamesmanship, you've got to learn gamesmanship. It, it, it has a softer tone to it, you know, appealing for every throw on, appealing for every corner. Is that bad? Is it wrong? Is it, you know, am, am, I, am, am I, I'm probably guilty, guilty is the right word, of, of telling senior teams we can't be too nice. Well, the, the interesting but, but, bit there is that it was organisational. The opposition coaches definitely knew what was going on. 100% because the players didn't do that themselves. So organisationally, they knew what was happening. Now, when we talk about dark arts, uh, that sort of, I don't know where that fits in terms of gamesmanship or deviance, however you want to look at it, but there are lots of things that happen around the dark arts. So, uh, you know, some some now, even now, uh, and I had a, I was talking to a school psychologist, there are teams um, that will own, in the Premier League, they will only water the half that they are attacking in the second half. Mm. So at half time comes on, they would deliberately put the sprinklers on in that half, leave the other half dry. You're talking Premier League, they're, and they're doing this on purpose. And it's not hidden. Uh, there are teams now that are um, they are using uh, crowd noise. So this is they're considering it a dark art. They're using crowd noise for when they have attacking corners. When the other team get a corner, they don't do anything. They are at, they are deliberately using as many different psychological ploys, the dark arts, different things they can. Uh, different to what they used to do in the olden days with the, you know, heating on in the in the summer, you know, cold water only in the winter, etc. They are looking for as many different ways as they can to exploit the opposition, you know, dark arts, whatever you want to label it. They're looking for as many different things as they can to get that competitive advantage mm -hmm. to try and win, which is, I mean, it's crazy. Go to the Emirates Stadium, look at how the Arsenal dressing room is set up for the home team versus the away team. I mean, I'm sure we've got people on here that could give us loads of detail, but, you know, the, uh, the Arsenal one is designed in a horseshoe shape, so you can see everyone. Uh, you go to the away dressing room, there's a massive like, tower in the middle of it, so the manager can't really see everyone if they're all sitting down. And is that a dark art that they've done? I don't know, because, uh, so, you know, again, like anything else, it's about how you as an individual cope with these adversities, and they are that, they're adversities whether they are um, subtle or whether they're blatant. And, and sometimes these uh, things can actually provide more, um, uh, if you like, uh, determination in your opponent in terms of their play. So I'm not convinced that dark arts 
of that nature actually uh, statistically would have a, a greater benefit than they would would not, if you know what I mean. Because some people respond to things really differently. It does depend on that mindset issue in terms of what you're experiencing. It can be, look, they've done this to us, look at this, look at that, right, let's go out and show them, let's do this, let's do that. And actually it could be more of a rallying cry for the individuals to actually play at a higher level of performance than they might have otherwise played. So I'm not necessarily convinced it, it would always be detriment. I don't know, are there any, any other all of views that, on that? All of that stuff could be, if, if Arsenal only water the, the end they're attacking when they're playing, let's say when they're playing Spurs, Spurs can do the same when, when Arsenal play Spurs the other way around. And then some of that stuff that you're talking about, I think, is like, is it can be controlled. Like the 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 wristband stuff is like, it's yes, got to be like a criminal case rather than yeah, a, like, be, yeah, a football yeah. case, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that, there's lots of got like the sexual assault one that took place on the pitch is, you know, it's effectively a, you know, sexual assault. That happened, yeah, especially yeah. It's happening twice. It's not an accident. But there, there are lots of things that, People might consider to be the dark arts how to hold people. Uh, like that's a, that's one that's being taught. Watch, there's videos on um, on Spurs's academy from years ago how to lose somebody by getting your arms up, almost like a windmill. Some of you will have seen that. There's loads and loads of different little tricks they're using to try and win games in different ways, uh, as many different ways as possible. Uh, so players now, some players they're they're very clever um, and they'll learn how to swear at the opposition in their language so the referee doesn't understand it mm. and that's not that's not a joke but there are players that that understand two or three swear words and they're able to use that the ref won't be able to pick it up so you won't be done for foul and abusive language or insulting somebody else so there are little things that you can do to, to try and trigger that reaction in somebody else um, so i would urge you just to consider if you are going to teach the dark arts or you know and i would hope most people aren't going to use them or teach them Think about what the trade-offs are. So you might turn around and get a, a short-term win, but what are the what are the what is the cost and who pays, if you like? Because often, as a coach, it's not going to be you. It's going to be the player that you're working with, and it might not just be the player you're working with. But we all know that lots of players then go on to become coaches, and they often, through social learning, they take with them some of the lessons that they've learned along the way. So yeah, you might you think you've only impacted that that one group of eleven players. But that 11 group, that 11 may end up going off and, you know, five or six of them becoming coaches. You've now impacted quite a large number of people or, or kids, if you like, through teaching or uh, misguiding through the dark arts. So from my perspective, try and steer clear of them. Uh, I like talking about them. I'm not a big fan of them in terms of practice, uh, although I know David is writing a list of these so that he can try and win that World Cup that he's so desperate to about <laughs> taking the field. So, um, we're, I mean, there's lots of things that we could sort of go into, and you've already discussed some of these, but, you know, diving to win a free kick or a penalty, lots of you have already talked about that. Is it, is it ethical? Is it unethical? That, again, will come down to you. The one thing that I would say is, from a coaching perspective, are you consistent? So when it goes for you or against you, that's an interesting one. And you guys have already spoken a little bit about that. Um, so physical intimidation, when do, we, when do we sort of draw the line? At, you know, G and the team up to go out and, and compete versus actually we've gone on down, down the route of these guys are now committing assault on each other. They're going out and they're, we've hyped, as a coach, we've hyped them up or I've hyped them up too much. Uh, and they've now gone and crossed that line. And you have to be really conscious of your role as a coach when it comes to um, not, not over-motivating your team, but potentially over-stimulating them to the point where they, they feel it's almost become a, a battle or a, a war of attrition rather than a game of football. That bit is, is on you as a coach sometimes through the, the emotive team talks that are given um, rather than handing some of that over to the players and even sometimes then reining the players in if they go off a little bit too far. So bear some of those, those responsibilities yourself because you could potentially be caught, you could potentially be responsible for some of the things that happen, uh, and and being aware, and that might go down to you. You are aware that a player has made a bad tackle on one of your players. Now you know your players. If you leave your player on, potentially they are going to retaliate and and do somebody some harm. So then you may end up going. Look, 
we're, we're losing the game or we're winning the game, wherever the context might be. But for everybody's sake, I'm going to take my player off so that this doesn't escalate anymore rather than leave my player on and it could get a little bit worse. Uh, and, it, you know, that's almost doing the bigger thing and not worrying about what the other team are going to do, even if it's one of their better players that they've left on who might be the someone who's uh, sort of upsetting your player and, and maybe going to be on the other end of that uh, retaliatory foul. So think about how you would manage those situations, those scenarios, because we don't often, we don't really think about them too much until they actually happen. And by then it could almost be too late. So, you know, if I was, if I was Alex Ferguson, and the reason I mentioned, if I was Alex Ferguson and we're playing against City, I don't know if I would have played Keane, knowing what had happened between him and Haaland. Now, that's a controversial statement because he's one of your best players in the middle. But if I'm Alex Ferguson, I know Keane and I have a feeling that Keane's going to go out there and Keane's going to be looking to exact some revenge. But that would be my personal perspective on how I would deal with that situation. Other people would think that we, we've got to get the three points and we need our best team. So, again, it would be on you to decide how you would operate in those situations. But think about it before it does happen. That's one of the things that we don't often do as a coach when we go back to our, our, um, our value framework, our belief framework. What is it that we hold most important? For me, one of the values that I hold really important is integrity. Uh, and I, I didn't put that on the sheet earlier, but I'll just use the word values. When you talk about honesty and integrity, if we're talking about players that I'm working with, I want them to do the right thing. You know, that is one of the fundamental things that we would, we would ask of our players or I would ask of my players. Do the right thing, because at the end of the day, um, you know, if you go out there and you break somebody's leg, well, that's still maybe somebody's dad that now can't walk or take their kids to school or pick their daughter up, whatever it might be. So be really careful of that. Uh, it's just a game of football. So try and instill those values in a consistent manner. So last slide from me, uh, and I'm going to open up the, the breakout rooms in case anyone did want to continue chatting away. And I know that some of you have, have got Celebrity Jungle to watch, um, but look, that is one of the key things I would say, be consistent. Uh, so if you are talking about players, and I mean consistent, look, if you're consistent in terms of, look, you want your players to go down um, when they get touched in, touch in the other box, when it happens to you, don't moan about it. I think that's an important thing. You know, and one of you guys mentioned that earlier. Is it okay if it happens to, to our team then? And you might turn around and go, actually, look, it's part of the game. We, I, I see it as part of the game and I'm just going to take it that way. We'll win some, we'll lose some. Um, but that's it's just important for you. Players will respond much better to consistent messages if that happens. Um, and consider your, your value framework around context. So do your values or will your values change depending on the environment that you're in? So for example, you might turn around and say, I'm completely against uh, diving to win penalties um, and I'm, I'm just not going to have it. But I'm now managing a non-league team um, and if we don't get a penalty, you know, in the last five minutes, uh, we don't go into the playoffs and we might not go up or, or, you know, we're at the other end of the table and I might lose my job. Then all of a sudden people then turn around and go, Look, that means I might potentially lose my income. Does, do my values change in that environment? in that context that's something that you have to be aware of and you should think about as a coach and I would urge you to, to get other coaches to think about in terms of well if we talk about values and we you know, I hear the word all the time philosophy uh, philosophy and then you look at the word ethos the, the lived values if you if you really understand your philosophy and it is a philosophy it will be consistent but if you are going down the route of well it depends you know if I'm coaching at you know, Harrow Borough men's team and we're, we're in the, the you know, the, the uh, Shield final or whatever it is. Uh, and we've got a chance for somebody to get a little bit of contact and go down. I'm taking that. Whereas you might then turn around and go, oh, actually, at under 11s, I'm going to completely discourage my players from doing it. I would urge you to think, actually, just try and have a consistent approach. Because if you start becoming inconsistent, don't be surprised when your players inconsistent you know you'll then turn around one week player stays on his feet and you have a go at him and he's gonna say well listen one last week you told me to stay on my feet this week i've got a chance to go down uh, or a chance to stay on my feet i've done it and i've got a shot and i haven't scored but you're giving me different messages so as a coach uh, as a, a coach developer lots of you will be in that role where you're you're out there working with other coaches try and get people to really understand what their values are because the, the the bit of philosophy that everybody seems to talk about 
is the the playing bit, the playing philosophy. That's different from your personal philosophy, your values. Once they're established and embedded uh, and lived, then only then I think will you be really comfortable in who you are, which is that bit that link back to that video, the the first one we did, understanding yourself. Only then will you be really consistent uh, and really happy with who you are as a coach. But you've got to get your values right first. You've got to get them consistent. All right, I'm going to open up the breakout rooms because I don't know if anyone wants to have a chat. Um, you're more than welcome to stay on the line. We have got some some very knowledgeable people here and some people with some good ideas and some people with some uh, some competitive streaks in them, David. So I'm just, <laughs> rock, rock, paper, scissors champion. No, the, the reality is that we are all different and we have uh, different values. So I, have, like I said, I don't agree that uh, any of this right on here is wrong bit for me is as long as you're consistent and your players know what they're getting I don't have a problem with it that bit is fundamental for me moving forward um so if you do want to stay on you're more than welcome Gary is that a high five or a question a uh, question because I've got a show mate um no worries. or more a more a statement really um I've been brilliant tonight Kev again um and I just want to say that you know we off the back of everything we've spoken about it's not hard to do the right thing and we all know what the right thing is because we're, I'd imagine the majority of us on here are developing players and trying to develop people ultimately. And I think that it's having the right values, beliefs, behaviours, principles, morals, that, you know, that goes without saying. Um, and that's quite easy to do. I don't see it being a difficult message. I see it being quite a simplistic message if you own it, but you've got to own it and live it. I agree, mate, 100%. It's down to you. That's all. Well. Top stuff. Uh, but again, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed sort of having a yeah. chat with everyone and sharing some ideas because it is important that we, we do talk to each other uh, and do challenge each other. It's important that we have different ideas uh, and different, um, different mindsets because, you know, there's people that, like I said earlier, Somebody challenged mine when I said, yep, I'm definitely going to take that pill. They challenged, <laughs> uh, take the 10 years, get dementia. And they were like, actually, would you completely change my mind after about 10 minutes? So that is one of the beautiful things around coaches talking and sharing. And if we don't do that enough, you know, potentially we're going to get stuck in our ways. That's so true. And, you know, with, as he's been saying about the, the, the ethics and the dark arts and, and what have you, and what, what lengths coaches would go through to, um, to just win a game because I've been, you know, through experiences uh, have changed my, my views on how we should go about or how I would like to go about winning a game um, because of those um, bad things that have happened um, around teams that I've been involved with. Um, I had one side, um, and this is where the line was really crossed uh, because we're talking back in the, it would have been in the late, late, yeah, late 80s, early 90s. And that was part, bit, bit was racial, but a bit of it was, as you put in one of the statements um, about ethics, um, uh, intimidation, the physical intimidation, where the manager of the opposing team was playing the top of the league uh, final, and they turned around and, and said, they've got a few black players in the team. When they're on the floor, give them a kick, right, to get a reaction out of our players to try and get them sent off. And that's what, and I, the reason why I know that is me and the manager of my team were stood outside their door waiting to get the practice balls, the warm-up balls, and we couldn't believe what we was hearing that, that their manager was saying in the dressing room, that he had, he had told them, instructed them to do that. And they went out there and done it, to go and, and do it. We saw it in the game. We went and saw the referee and he said, I'll keep an eye out for it. And it was happening in the game. Every time one of our players went down on the floor, they tried to, um, uh, kicking to get a reaction. It did kick off after the game, mind you, because we won and they were really upset. But um, it was an instruction from their coach to go and do that to um, to our players. Because the black players in the team asked me, is it true, Ruth? Is this the truth? And I said, yes, it is the truth. That's what they're going to do. So look after yourselves when you're on that pitch. Um, and we also know about players at uh, elite level about is it the opposite side? If you're going to commit a foul, you do it on the opposite side to the linesman behind the
the referee so they can't see yeah. as well. So these are all things, yeah, that coaches or managers turn around and tell their sides to go and do. Yeah. I thought I'd just drop that, put that in point in there. And that's, that's the importance of the role of the coach. And that's the bit, mate. We have a responsibility. You know, sometimes we get the players too hyped up. We don't, we don't leave it down to the players. We just, we have to be careful and we have to be responsible as coaches. Uh, again, thank you all for your time. I'm not going to keep you on any longer. Uh, I really appreciate having you all on. It's been lovely, lovely to see uh, so many familiar faces and a couple of new ones as well. Um, but like I said, if you need anything, just get in touch. And uh, we have got uh, some more coming up. So Simon Millington's going to do one. Um, he's done some stuff recently. It looks really good around uh, sort of uh, coach competencies uh, linked to some academic work. And it looks actually really insightful. So I would suggest if you get a chance to either check that out live or, or watch it on a webinar. I think it will be on a Wednesday. That's what we're looking at. Not, not this Wednesday coming. Uh, sort of Wednesday after. I think it's the 16th. Uh, I'll send some stuff out and hopefully it'll spark some interest. And if you've got any ideas on anything you want to see, let me know, because uh, Rich Horner has agreed to do something with us. Um, just a matter of finding out um, if there's anything that you guys want to see. So he just said, look, can you ask if, if there's anything in particular that coaches want, uh, want to see from him? Uh, and obviously some of you will know Rich, but, you know, a licensed tutor, pro licensed coach, uh, worked with Arsenal's academy as sort of uh, the FA's youth coach developer. Uh, Watford's Academy, all these different clubs really knows his stuff, excellent deliverer, um, so if there is anything that you want to see, uh, just drop me an email uh, and I will see if I can get him to come on and share some ideas Perfect Thanks all, and uh, thanks I'll, all. See you. Brilliant. I'll see you thanks, Kev. soon See you again soon, thanks Kev, thanks everyone Later, bye bye Have a good weekend Kevin And you mate, see you later, bye Very Easy, Master Chef. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Have a good weekend. Bye. Right, take, take care, care everybody. Good luck, good luck. Bye. See you later, Kevin. Catch up soon.